So um, what's this topic? Live in me. I just want to make sure I was consistent with uh, what was written. So uh, this topic is kind of a, not really, but a follow-up topic to the first topic. Um, and the, the title is Live in Me. And there's a verse that, uh, that I think is, is very strong that St. Paul says that I, I love this verse. He says, it is no longer I who live, lives, but Christ who lives in me, right? And I think this kind of comes back to your question earlier. You said, why do we do all this, right? Of course, you're talking about this being seven hour services, which we discussed not to discuss, but um, what, we, what, what we do, the other things is, he says, it's no longer I who lives, right? And so the I who lives part is the old man, the old Adam, right? The, the stuff we inherited. And he's basically said, I've, I've, I've killed that guy, right? And now it's Christ who lives in me, right? And so the idea behind, you know, really the ultimate idea behind Christianity if, in a nutshell, right? Is this idea that you just have to get out of the way, right? The kingdom of heaven is inside us. God's inside us, right? So, you know, when we pray, we don't have to look up. We have to look in. God's in, right? And we just have to be, it just has to be less of us, just less you. <laughs> less you, more God. So the only thing I can do is crucify the self, crucify the flesh, crucify the me, crucify the ego, crucify my own will. And the less of me there is, the more Christ comes through. And I don't have to do it, you know? Like, you know, sometimes we do these practices like, you know, let's, 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 uh, let's be humble for a week, you know, or we're going to do humble week, right? And we're all going to be humble, okay? And, you know, I mean, like, if you have to try to be humble, you're not humble, right? I mean, if you have that, I got to be humble, I got to be humble, I have to be humble. Well, you're not humble then, right? Because you don't actually think you need to be humble, right? So that's not how you become humble, right? You, you, be, you, be, you, you have to just allow the fact that you see Christ in you, and that, that generates a natural kind of humility. All right, so this verse, I'll get back to point. Um, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, right? And of course, this comes very importantly from the Eucharist. And the Eucharist is not important. The Eucharist is everything. So it's not an important part of our spiritual life. It's everything. Right? It is life, right? It is how Christ becomes absorbed in us, right? And if you think about it, it's like given to us a method of food, right? Where your body digests every, every part of this food, right? And, and it, it, it morphs into every cell in your body, right? So Christ becomes a part of us. And the verses he says in, in the Gospel of John chapter 6 at the end, it's just shocking. Like, unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, you have no life in me. Who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in you. All right. So I want to read you this wonderful quote from St. Cyril of Alexandria. He says, just by melting two candles together, you get one piece of wax. So I think the one who receives the flesh and blood of Jesus is fused together with him by this communion. And the soul that he finds is in Christ and Christ is in him. Right. So you, you can imagine, you know, you, you take one of those, you know, you take some like regular candle, right? And you get some sweet smelling candle from Bed Bath and Beyond, right? You melt them both down and you you mix them into one candle, right? And you recreate a new candle. You can't distinguish one candle from the next, right? And the new candle smells like the old, like the like the, the nice candle, right? You've morphed into it. And so he's saying that's what Christ is when he comes into us. He it's like two candles that just melt and then you create a new candle comprised of these two candles, right? This is how we become a part of him. And so Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way. I am everything, right? And so the whole point, right, is to become a part of him. We do this, obviously, through the Eucharist. And as we become a part of him, um, we take on his image, right? So in the first talk, I, I, we, we talked about Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then he says, in another place, you are the light of the world, right? And so who's the light? He's the light. 
He's the light shining through you. And so as I take on Christ and I put on Christ and I become a candle mixed with Christ, I start to take on God's images, God's image, right? And that's the whole point, right? We're supposed to be the image and likeness of God. Right? And we know that we're all in the image. Everyone who's born is in the image of God, right? It's just like a baby, right? When a baby's born, you know, we're all excited, right? Look at she has my ears and he has your hands and look at his eyes, right? And it's like, I think that's my chin, but I'm not sure, right? And, you know, when they're all born, they all look like blobs anyway, right? So they're all the same as far as I'm concerned. But that's not important. I did not say that to my wife. I was smart enough to not say that. I'm like, he's so cute. He's not a blob. Anyway, so... I have to repress the old man. <laughs> um, what are you talking about? So the, every baby is born in the image of its parents. And the parents like that, right? But then what do the parents do? What's parenting? What are you guys doing as parents? Well, you say, do this and don't do this, right? And well, on what basis are you making that decision? The kid hits another kid in the head. He takes his training. Bam. And you say, don't do that. What are you really saying? I wouldn't do that. Right? And what you're really doing is you're morphing your child, without you being aware, into your likeness. Right? You basically make everything they do that you would do, you say, good job. Why would you say good job? Because that's something you would do. And when they do something you wouldn't do, you say, bad job. And so you create them and you make them into your likeness. And in fact, nothing gives a kid, a parent, more pride when their kid does something they would do, right? Like when my son makes a joke that I would make, or like I, I think it, like he's 21 now, and like someone says something and I think of a joke and then he says the joke. And I'm so proud, right? And I'm like, yes, my boy, right? And I'm so, because now he's what? in my likeness right and i'm so ego filled right that i want my kids to be little clones of me okay to a certain degree right god wants us to be in his likeness. so we're all born in the image but that likeness takes time that's the work that's raising the child and that's what we we, we aim for as christians to become his likeness to think the same things and to say the same things and so as we enter into a life with god we do that we start to talk like Jesus. We start to think like Jesus. We start to respond like Jesus. And this is the point of reading the Bible and living in the, in the, in the moment with Christ throughout the events of his life. We start to kind of absorb him. Right? What would Jesus do? I love that bracelet. You know, we give it to little kids, WWJD, right? What would Jesus do? That's like the perfect thing, right? Because that's ultimately our goal is to become his likeness to answer the way he would answer, to approach a problem the way he would have approached it, okay? And, and by the way, this is where the understanding of theology is useful, right? Sometimes, unfortunately, we reduce, again, I don't want to get excommunicated, we reduce God to books and theology and studying, and I learned this, and the Father said that. All right, who cares? But what good is that? You want to spout out some facts and some knowledge, and we learn about God because I want to learn about my dad because I want to be like my dad. I want to understand who my dad is. Right? And this is why we study theology and study the church. And so St. Augustine has this wonderful quote. He says, a Christian is a mind through which Christ thinks, a heart through which Christ loves, a voice through which Christ speaks, and a hand through which Christ helps. So you become the voice and the hands and the heart and the mind of Christ. Right, and we we hear this right when when people would meet someone like Abu Shoy Kamen, right, the saint uh, from from sporting, they would say, "We didn't know who Jesus was until we met you, and then we figured it out." Right, the sweetness and the gentleness and the way he spoke and the way he loved, you felt it, right? you felt Christ, and it's very attractive. And and this is what Saint Peter implores us to be. He says, "We are called to be partakers of divine nature." Right? In the Eastern Orthodox Church, they call this theosis. Right? I, I take on the characteristics of God. I become a partaker in the divine nature of Christ. And that's what I'm supposed to be. Okay? So, um, and, and like I said you know, before, this, this, this analogy by St. Athanasius, right? the sun and the moon, I reflect God in every way. Uh, Father Matthew the Poor, always I just quote him. 
He says, so God created man in his own image so that man should bear, bear witness in himself to God's self. Say it again. God created man in his own image so that man should bear witness in himself to God's self. So the reason God created us in his image is so that we become little images to everyone about who God is. They should see us and feel God and hear God. And so we need to take on these characteristics, right? St. John Chrysostom has this very harsh quote that really sucks. You guys, some of you were saying, you know, the stuff strikes deep. This one always hurts me. He says, there would no, be no need, there would be no need for sermons, like what I'm giving right now, if our lives were shining. There would be no need for words if we bore witness with our deeds. There would be no more pagans if we were true Christians. It's perfect, right? And so a lot of times we get caught up in saying things and, you know, you know, putting out information and propaganda and just have to be, you know, and, and sometimes being is, not sometimes, always, being is much harder than doing, right? It's very easy to do stuff. We can get involved in activities and we can do all the stuff and have all the meetings and have activities. We, we do that all day, right? But the stuff we talked about in the first talk, being Christians, that's work. Right. In fact, I would much rather do than be. Doing is easy. Right. You want me to come and make tameya for the bazaar? No problem. I'll make food all day. You tell me to go forgive her after what she said? Never. Right. And we all know, you know, someone your mom has been fighting with for 15 years because of a wedding back in 1975. They added together, you know, lives and you know, there we go. And we're off to the race. Right? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not a good person, right? So, um, so we're we're all we're all called to be the the creator of the image of our creator. Okay? okay, so God has lots of characteristics. He's nice, he's good, good hygiene, whatever, right? One of the characteristics of Christ is that He's a creator. That God is a creator. Now, if I'm called to be in the image and likeness of God, and God creates. That one's kind of hard, right? I get all the other ones, right? But creator, that's a tough one. So I want to kind of probe together what it means for us to share in the image and likeness of God when he creates. So God creates and he builds up. He transforms. He takes from darkness to light, right? He develops from less to more. He refines. He builds, right? He creates, and he creates in the way that we see creation happening in the world. He taught us how to create. He cultivates, right? St. John Cassian talks about a farmer. And he says a farmer, a farmer is futile if he thinks that his work produces crops. Because every farmer knows that you can do all the things right, but if the rains don't come and the sun doesn't come and the, and the birds come, that you're hosed, right? Do people still say hosed? Is that my generation? Okay. Just checking. Every decade I check just to see where I um, say here's the world. Anyway, so what was I talking about? So um, God is the one who does these things, right? So he's the one who builds, he's the one who creates, right? So I want to share with God in that aspect. I want to be a creator. Right? I want to build, I want to make from more to less, from light to darkness. So then how do I manifest this? characteristic, right? How do I actually do this? St. Isaac the Syrian has this beautiful quote. I love him. He says, spread your cloak over those who fall into sin, each and every one, and shield them. This is really hard. Spread your cloak over those who fall into sin. What does that mean? Cover them. And this is the exact opposite of today's culture. Today's culture, expose, shame, cancel, attack. And, and you can do it under the guise of raising awareness. I just want to raise awareness. I want to raise awareness about your sins. I want everyone to know about your sins. I'm very interested in everyone else's sins except mine. Right? And this is, this is Satan 101. Right? 
If you can get you, if you can, if he can get you to look at anyone but you, he wins. Right. And now we have social media. So I can see everyone's Belewi all the time. Right. All the problems and everyone, can you believe this racist pig? Yeah, comment, 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 comment. Right. And we can all attack each other on social media and spend seven hours. So when I think about the liturgy, what happens at the liturgy? Two things happen. Right. First thing is I become a part of Christ. Okay. And what's the second thing? Transitive property. Right? If I become a part of Christ and you become a part of Christ, then I become a part of you. That means you and I are part of the same body. And that's a big thing. Right? That isn't we work together, we pray together, we go to the same church, we run the same social circles, we have the same interests, we both like Tamiya, right? That's not what we're talking about at all, right? We're part of the same body, right? And so the way the body protects itself and the way the body, uh, we can learn so much from just studying the body, right? And there are cells in the body whose only job it is, is to repair the other cells. So are there people in this church whose only job it is, is they kind of go around through the church without anyone knowing and they find broken people and they help them. And there's people who just do that, by the way. And you probably don't even know who they are. Right? And so there's all these functions in the body that teach us. So I want to read you this quote from St. Teresa of Lisieux. She says, often, when we see another soul more enlightened than us, immediately we conclude that Jesus loves us less than this enlightened soul, and that we cannot be called to the same perfection. I am a little brush that Jesus has chosen in order to paint his image in the souls he has entrusted to my care. So she's saying, I'm a little brush. An artist doesn't only use one brush, but needs several. The first brush is great and useful as it applies the general tints and colors that canvas entirely in a very short period of time, right? So you can imagine she's talking about an artist, right? So you have that first brush, like a roller, right? Where you just roll the whole thing. And so some brushes are kind of these broad strokes. Another brush, a much smaller one, he uses for details. God may wish to do a very great work in the souls of his children through others, yet I may be a very small brush he deems to use afterwards for the smallest details. So I want you to see her role. Her role, as she sees it, is she wants to finish the details in people who are the icon of Christ. So she wants to paint onto people the image of Christ and make it perfect. And that she sees as her role, a small brush. And I want you to think about this image that she said, because it really struck me. When you see an image, when you see an icon that's half finished, okay, you know, it isn't quite done, right? The details aren't there, the eyes aren't quite done, right? And you want to finish this icon. You say, this icon doesn't look like Jesus yet. It's not that good. It's not finished yet. How should I finish this icon? I know. I'll take a hammer and I'll hit the icon until it is finished. And that will perfect it. Good idea? Stupid. However, very, very, very calm. We see somebody... We think you are not the finished icon of Christ. You are not perfect yet. You are still lacking. I will finish this icon. I will take a hammer and I will hit you. And I will hurt you. And I will say harmful things to you. And I will say you're a sinner. And I'll say you're a bad person. And I will attack you. And I will loathe you. And I will say this person shouldn't even be in the church. And this person may corrupt our kids. And this person. And I will go on the offensive and attack others. Is that Finnish icons? But it is a very, unfortunately, common approach. Right? We all grew up, I'm not saying, we all grew up in churches where the gossip and judgment was may may, right? We all remember the tons who looked us up and down and gave us in and talked and gossiped and judged and attacked. Did it build up anybody? Did it help anybody? Just created hatred. You just felt unloved. Right? And we see this all over America, 
right? I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a, a culture war that's happening. And I want to warn all of us Christians that we have to be careful with this culture war, right? Because when I see whatever the, the gay agenda going out there and doing a bunch of things, and I disagree with that agenda, how do I disagree with it? Do I hit it with a hammer? Or do I say, I have to crush these people? They are the enemy. They are the problem. Do I hit people with hammers? Or do I, as Sanchez says, take a brush and paint on the people and finish? And so sometimes we go into this attack mode, right? We do it with our kids, we do it with our spouses, we do it with our parents, we do it with our siblings. And when we see something bad in them, we attack it. And that's not what Christ did ever. Ever. In fact, he did the opposite, right? I mean, you'd see him like something like the Samaritan woman. It's just an amazing story, right? But when we just read it a few weeks ago, you have this woman, like, you know, all right, five husbands, whatever, right? She's not, she's not doing great. And what does Christ say? He says, you're honest. You said the truth. He pointed out arguably the one good thing in her. And it resonated, right? And she goes, yeah, you know what? I am honest. I don't lie. It's true I've had a sordid past with guys, but I'm not a liar. I tell the truth. And he saw in her beauty. And he pulled it out. And he complimented her. The one good thing in her. And she just sat right up. Right. And you guys will experience this, right? In your Sunday school classrooms, right? You see the Shetty boy or the whatever, the, the problem child, right? The, the one causing all. And you, you know, you want to just hit him with a hammer. Stand in the corner. I'm going to call your mom. I'm going to kick you out of the class. I'm going to yell at you. I'm going to threaten you. Right. But instead, if you take him aside, you go, you know what? I think you're the smartest kid in this class. I think you're really good at drawing. I love your genes. William Shoy Kamen used to say, don't ever talk to a kid about his sins. Talk to him about his shoes. Say, I love your shoes. You never tell a kid about his sins. You compliment him on his shoes. That's how you win hearts. Right? And so we see the kid, we try to hit him with a hammer. And we hit, he's not perfected yet. Right? It's not the right approach. I took a, uh, a class at Axe on iconography. I can't draw with beads. But um, I love icons and, you know, all that stuff. So I took this class. I was hoping they would, like, teach us things. They did. They just taught us how to draw. And I'm like, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to embarrass myself, right? So I'm an archdeacon for crying out loud. My indignity. <laughs> <laughs> so I took the class. And he would, he, would, he would have you submit. So he would, like, draw a picture live, right? And then he would have you like do it with him. He's like, okay, now draw, you know, put a line like that, put a line like that, put a circle through this, you know, blah, blah, blah. And people would do it, right? And then he would have you submit it to uh, online, okay? He would print it, right? And he says, all right, who did this one? Raise your hand, embarrassed, right? And, looks, and they all look like, like deformed human beings, right? I mean, none of them look like Jesus at all. Like they're all really bad, right? And so I would see this like horrible thing that one of these students did. Like, this, disgusting right can you know i can't draw but you guys are idiots right <laughs> and so and then he would do this thing where he'd go okay I, I see what you did here i like this i like that you got good you know a good start he started all this it's a good start right and i watch him he's on zoom okay and he just start with his pencil he would just say well you see the eyes you see if you just went like this and he would just make it beautiful and I would just like go, wow, that's exactly what we need to do. He could just attack the person like, you should really drop out. You have no talent. You know, God hates you. He could have said a lot of things, right? Things that, you know, I think I thought about, right? But I'm like, Jesus doesn't love you, right? But, um, but he wouldn't, right? He would just fix it. And I thought, wow, this is what we're called to do with each other. Call out the beauty compliment say you're at a good start but you know if you just like I just roll the eye right here it would look so much better let me show you right and gently you know and and you know you see this with a child right when a child's trying to draw a letter right and then, right and mom puts her hand not dad usually mom puts her hand 
over his hand, right? She's like, just go like this. Oh, look what you did, right? And that gentle touch, right? This is, this is how we become creators, right? This is how we participate in the image and likeness of God, right? He's a creator. He builds. He doesn't destroy, right? And that's just not God's style to destroy and to, to attack. Uh, there's a, a nice quote here by Metropolitan Anthony Bloom. Um, oh, there's another quote. Okay. He says, unless we look at a person and see the beauty there is in this person, we can contribute nothing to him. And I want to just stop there. Unless we see a person and look at see and see the beauty they're in, we can contribute nothing. So I want to just give you a piece of advice. If you see somebody and you don't see beauty, just stop. Because whatever you're about to say is not good. It's not going to be well received. It's not going to be liked. Unless you can see beauty in someone. And I'm talking about little kids, adults, parents, doesn't matter, right? Because what ends up happening is when you don't see beauty, people can tell you don't see beauty, right? I mean, we've all had these experiences, right? Where we interact with someone and they're just looking at you, you know, forgive me, the thoughts and uncles, right? They're looking at you when you're little and you could just see hatred in their eyes, right? And they're like, Habibi, and I'm worried about you, and they're like, you're not mm -hmm. You hate me, and I can tell. Right? And that's why the opposite is true, right? I mean, we all have that super loving Tita, right? And Tita just loves on us, right? And gives us food. And every time we come, she gives us compliments, right? And Tita can say anything she wants to you, right? Tita can say, Habib, you're so fat. <laughs> right? And you're like, I love you too, Tita. <laughs> it doesn't, Tita can say anything she wants, right? Because Tita loves. So I will take anything from someone who loves me but I will take nothing from someone who doesn't love, right? And it doesn't matter what you say, you can say the sky is blue and I'm like, oh, really? You think so, buddy? <laughs> right? When someone doesn't love me, but he continues. One does not help a person by discerning what is wrong, what is ugly and what is distorted. Christ looked at everyone he met, at the prostitute, at the thief and saw the beauty hidden inside them. Perhaps it was distorted, Perhaps it was damaged, but it was beauty nonetheless. And what he did was to call out this beauty. This is how we build. This is how we build each other. This is how we build a community. This is how we, this is how we participate with God as a creator. This is how we create, we build. St. John Chrysostom has this interesting quote. He says, for Christians above all men are forbidden to correct the stumblings of sinners by force. Christians above all men are forbidden to correct the stumblings of sinners by force. We don't force anyone to do anything, right? We don't force them to come to church. We don't guilt them. We don't attack them when they don't show up. It is necessary to make a man better, not by force, but by persuasion. We have neither authority. We neither have authority granted us by law to restrain sinners nor, if it were, should we know how to use it, since God gives the crown of those who keep, who are kept from evil, not by force, but by choice. God gives us a free will. If I want to be in the image and likeness of God, I have to give others a free will. And we see this in the parable of the prodigal son, like in spades. Son says, hey, dad, wish you were dead. Can I have the money now? I want to go hang out with hookers. And dad goes, okay. This is the kind of freedom we have. And yet we don't give that same grace to others. We force them to act the way that we want. And sometimes, you know, calling out this beauty in somebody is perfect, right? We see this with our kids, right? Sometimes your kids will mess up, okay? And they'll come running to you and they'll be crying. They're like, I did it. I broke the blah, blah, blah. And then I did this and I did that, right? And then as they, you know, they get, a, you know, my kid's age, right? They're teenagers like, yeah, I took the car behind your back and I crashed it because I was drunk. And you're like, Habibi, should we get out of jail now? Or you want to do that later? And, you know, sometimes the only thing you can think to say as a parent is what? Well, thank you for being honest. That's all you got. I really, nothing else you did is good, right? But at least you're honest. And that 
it's very much the image and likeness of God. Because he called out the one thing good in everything you did. He said, at least you're honest. And that's perfect. Okay. Sorry, I print in like really big font because I don't want to like, you know. All right, so how do we build others around us? How do we participate in this act of creation? How do we do this? Okay. St. Peter says in his epistle, finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called. And another characteristic of God is he turned evil into good. And that's really hard to do. Right, I mean, it kind of comes back to the, the doormat question, right? And do I repay evil with evil? And it's very hard to be compassionate and not repay evil with evil and insult with insult, but to absorb it. Now, how do you absorb it without feeling like a doormat? How do you serve and not get quote unquote burnt out? How do you love someone and not get burnt out? Like I'm done with this, what's the trick? Yeah, a little bit more. The love of God inside me uh, reflects. Okay. The trick is, look, as, as Christians, we are called to love, but we are not called to be loved. No one promises us that we're going to be loved in the world. In fact, Jesus on multiple occasions said, they hated me, they're going to hate you too. They killed me, they're going to kill you too. And in fact, you look at the lives of all the saints, <laughs> usually don't end well, right? They're usually killed or someone like, you know, Pope Krill is persecuted, right? In fact, you don't have to go far. Jesus, love, 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 love. What do you get? A spear, a cross, and bad things. So this is, this is what Christians sign up for. We sign up to love and not get loved. It's one direction. Right? You all see this in your marriages. <laughs> you don't sign up for, I'm going to get this and this and this and this. I sign up for, I give. It's one directional. And then the blinders go on. But she didn't, but he didn't. <laughs> that doesn't matter. That's not your calling. Your calling is one direction. So how do we not get burnt out? We just don't expect anything. Right? It's one way. I just pour love. And I don't care if there's any result because the result, as, as was just said, the love I'm giving is to God, right? And, and if I give, it's, it's done. Right? So whether or not you like me or accept me or realize you're wronged because I was humble, you know, a year from now and apologize like you should, doesn't matter. I don't really care. I don't want your apology. In fact, I don't even want you to know I'm doing anything good. Right? I want to stay beneath the surface. I want to stay hidden. I want to do good things and not let anyone know. I'm not expecting, you know, to be recognized by a Neil Hidma or recognized by people in the church, or recognized by a Buna, or recognized by the bishop, or who cares? Right? I don't do any of that stuff for anybody. I do it for God only. So it's very focused, right? And then you don't get burnt out. In fact, when people don't appreciate you and then disrespect you and then say something about you, it's kind of nice. They're good. No one knew. No one figured it out. Right? And I'm not thinking, you know, in a few years, he's going to figure out what I did for his kid, and then he's going to love. Thought doesn't occur to me. Right? In fact, the more you hate me, the better. Because I don't care what you think. Right? And I'm not doing it for you anyway. So, as St. Peter says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. And then you do it for God, and you stay focused on this is a one-way track, and this only goes in one direction. It's so much easier. You never get burnt out. Do we have any questions? I'm kind of debating with the students as I debate internally. Comments? Yes, Tony. How do we interpret or understand God loves? I, I agree with you a thousand percent. Also, God chases. And what's the 
proper way to view love within chasing. Um, it's automatically when you feel love and it's like dubbed up and like hugs, like bring in for love. Um, but understanding the tough love and how it plays a role in our development um, as individuals and our development uh, relationship within. Um, probably asking the wrong guy. Um, so I'm not a, I'm not a tough love kind of guy. And there's room over here. That's what they're all trying to tell you. God has to break that first. And I think that's, that is tough love, right? Well, but the, the distinction is, yeah, who's doing the breaking, right? So I'm all for God can give tough love and God can break. Now, what's my role in tough loving you, right? And I think, I think that role needs discernment and wisdom, a lot of it, because we're all about tough loving each other. Right, I need to. I, I need to speak truth and love, bro. Right, that 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 verse. God help us. How many people have sinned using that verse? Right, and so everyone loves truth and love, and you know, and the one Arabic verse, wabbah, or you know, rebuke, whatever. Everyone loves that. One. They love the fact that Jesus flipped over tables. Jesus got angry. So they use those three things, right, of the whole gospel, and they just pound it. So. That role is 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 a is a very spiritual role. That is that is, and I'm not saying it has to be a priest, but it it, it takes a lot of discernment to be done, right? Because it has to come with overwhelming love that is felt, that's true, and everybody can spot fake. It takes me ten seconds, right? Right? Someone starts talking, and you're like, yeah, you don't love me, bro, right? So. As soon as I get that vibe, I don't care what you're saying, right? In fact, I'm going to do the opposite. Okay. So in, in my experience, I found that tough love, I leave that for God, right? And I go back on myself and say, I'm going to give love, love. I right? don't let God do the tough love, right? And that's just a better general approach to life, right? And if God puts you, calls you to that position, and it doesn't have to be a position, to that person in that situation, and you're really called to that, that tough love, and it's coming from a place of love, love, then it'll be accepted and, and, and you'll feel it. But it takes discernment. And I think we're too eager to jump on that truth and love bandwagon and, and you know, wait, wait five years and then say it, you know, and often it's gone by then, right? And St. Arsenio says, right, I've so many times regretted things I've said, I've never regretted things I don't say. Right. And, and I think Satan has, has, has put in this in our minds, like, well, if you don't post against racism, then you're complicit in racism. Right. So you have to speak out against it. And I, you know, it was like, there's a lot of issues I don't speak out against. Right. But I mean, they're bad. There's plenty of them, right. Including you judging others. Right. So I don't have to speak out. I don't have to call out every sin I see. I don't have to be, I have to be the light of the world, not with my words. Right. The same John Chrysostom says, right. No sermons, you know, and, and St. Seraphim of Sarab says, right, acquire the Holy Spirit and a thousand around you will be saved, right? So we're too into talking. We're too into like chastising. And, you know, let me, let me, let me put a, you know, God put a word in my heart for you. And, you know, it's just my way of whatever, right? And so once your ego is, and your, your, your um, intentions are purified, and that takes a long time, then I can love. Then when I, when I, like, you, you know, like there are people in my life that I just have to, you know, I, I just give them half a look, right? And they're like, okay, you know, I don't, I don't even speak, you know, and they'll just like, fine, you're right. I wouldn't do that, you know, and I, I'm like, I didn't say anything, you know? So err, err on that side. If you're going to err on a side, err on the side of patience and tolerance and respect to others and finding the little tiny thing that's good and pointing it out over and over again. You know, there's an old adage, there's an old story that says, this guy married this woman and she wasn't very pretty. 
and his friend was at the wedding and you know he's like all right she's not very pretty and then five years later he met the couple again and he meets the wife and she's beautiful it's like whoa what happens he goes this guy the guy and he's like you know when we got married she wasn't that pretty now she's beautiful and he said the reason she's beautiful is every day i told her you're beautiful and she became beautiful i love that story because i think people react that way people become they respond to affirmation they respond to love they respond to respect you know when I mean, you take a teenager who's you know messing up a lot of times they just need to be respected you know and i can't tell you how many times someone will tell me something and just say thank you for not judging me thank you for respecting me as a person that's it that's all i need you know Any other questions? Should we end now or should we keep going a few minutes? Yes. How do you balance like this? How do you affect know, like, um, kids can get picky, right? If they're like too nice and someone says something and they go instinctively like comment back, right? Because they can just like hi, you need my right? And then but that sometimes leads kids to other kids to see that and then target them a little bit. So how do you balance that in terms of like, you want everybody to like be kind and show up and whatever, but there are too many abuse behaviors and then how do you, how do you teach that, right? Yeah, how old's a kid? Well, like, let's say 11, 10. Teach them how to fight. <laughs> right across before they know what's happening. Chris Rock, or Will Smith, him. yeah. <laughs> Sucker punch. But from like elementary to like, you know, junior and high school, right? Where if you're teaching them, let's be kind of which I think is the right message, but then yeah, like how do you find that you know, is it really a balance or do you just get that message you know? Yeah, I mean look, it it's I'll, I'll tell you a story I heard yesterday. You guys in the fire. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a story I heard yesterday. Um, uh, I was visiting a friend, and he was telling me, you know, he's had a hard life, and he was telling me about when he was in second grade. He sat down at this table, and he said he, he, his 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 dad had passed away, and his mom didn't have any money, and she was too proud to ask for food, for money from the for, for school lunch. So he's like, I went to school every day and didn't have lunch. My mom was too proud to ask for the, the food and too poor to actually give me lunch and too stupid to know that that's not a good idea, okay? So he's like, you know, so I'm in third grade and I'm sitting at lunch and I'm just sitting there with all the kids watching them eat. And I would try to, you know, bum a French fry off a kid and he'd come in and eat that. And I would just like, and I was like, oh my gosh. And, and then, and then he said, so then one kid said to me, you know, well, why do you, uh, why do you steal everyone's food? He's like, I'm not stealing, I'm just asking my friends. And he's like, and then the guy goes, and he goes, I'm not your friend. And he goes, well, and he's like, hey, he's not your friend. He goes, well, he's my friend, he's my friend. And you know, they all go, no, we're not your friends either. It's third grade, right? And he said, all of them got up and moved to the next table all at the same time and left him sitting there by himself. Yeah. And, um, and I, you know, and, and he said, I just looked down to start crying, you know, if you can imagine. And so it's, it's, as a parent, I can imagine, like if I was his dad, I'd go kill them, right? That's just, that's just how that would end, right? I said, just point out, point, point them out to me as they're walking home. So that's all I need. Just show me which one. And my wife would have to hold my arm and say that, I don't know how to do that. Teaching the wrong things, aren't you an archdeacon? Whatever, right? <laughs> Not now. Take this off. Hold my cross. So, so the 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 hard part as a parent is you you're very uh, emotional, right? You're very invested. I was like this, right? I mean, anything happening to my kids, I was like Papa Bear, right? I was like just point them out. And you, you have to trust the process a little bit, right? And 
those pickings and those, you know, kind of like this is from Meatball, you learn not to put your faith in people and you learn to get a thick skin. And, you know, as parents, we want to bubble wrap our kids and it's not good for them at all. Right? In fact, we have a, a, a generation of kids who are just a big, hot mess, right? I mean, I, I teach, you know, college. I mean, you can't, these kids can't prick a finger, right? Without, you know, I, I need therapy, right? I need to go to the therapist, I got to be minus. Right? So this bubble wrapping, and so, you know, they're called helicopter parents. Well, now the new expression is bulldozer parents, right? So the bulldozer parents, they just bulldoze in front of their kids, any obstacles, so the kids can just walk and the obstacles are good for them they teach character they teach strength right they teach they teach um empathy when they see someone else picked on right so there's lots of good things by getting picked on right in fact there's a uh, uh excuse me just rock now that i think about it but uh <laughs> there's a comedian and not that i you know listen to a lot of comedians but i do and he was talking about, he, he said, he said he took his girls, two black girls to school and they were interviewing different schools. Of course, he's Chris Rock, he's loaded. This was like 10 years ago. And he said that we went to a school and they said, you know, here at the school, we don't tolerate any bullying. We don't tolerate any negative talk. We don't tolerate anything, blah, blah, blah. And he said, I immediately pulled my kids out of that school because I don't want them to grow up in that environment because that's not the way the world is. And I was like, oh, that's very thoughtful, right? So the point is, don't let it get to you. It hurts, okay? And, and the kids come and my kids have come and it's broken down in front of me. And my first, you know, it's a fist and there's rage. And, but then you have to, um, it, it, you have to model God to them, right? And you have to think of that as a parent. And you have to realize that your reaction is teaching them who God is right and that's very important to remember all the time it's very hard to do but you all need to remember your reaction to them is god they think they learn who god is from you right and so you have to think you know what would the father and the prodigal son story do what would jesus do and and temper that right and so the way i handled it is he would tell me about a bully Right, that said a bunch of things. And I would explain to him when they're younger and then older, I question them. I'd be like, what do you think uh, his dad's like? That bully. And he'd say, his dad's probably pretty rough. And I'd say, yeah. And I teach him that a lot of these bullies, they want friends. And they're, they're beat up at home. They're hurt. They don't know how to interact. They're sad. They're frustrated. They don't get good grades. They're not as smart as the other kids. And so I taught my kids to feel bad for the bully. And I said, you know, you want that bully to stop bullying you? Be nice to them. Go sit next to them at lunch. Say hi to them. Offer them parties, whatever. And a lot of times you think, oh, you're just giving in to the bully. No, the bully needs love, right? In fact, that very disruptive bad kid is the one who needs love the most. Right? And what do we do? We put him in the corner and we hit him with the hammer. He said, you're a bad kid. And he's like, you know what? My dad tells me that every day. My dad hits me every day. My mom tells me, you're no good every day. And so we go to take him to school and we say, you're no good. And we tell him they're bad. And he just wants anyone to tell them, you're pretty good. You can kick a ball really far. You're really strong. And then you watch the bully melt. So when you model Christ, there's a reaction to it. Now, it may not work. I don't know. Right? And you shouldn't do it with the expectation of getting the result. Right? But the more you can be that, the more they'll see God, who God really is. Right? Not nine-hour services, right? But who God really is. Okay? And they'll learn about God from you. I mean, I was talking to a girl just like three days ago. She's 28. And she's like, I'm done with church, I'm leaving church, I hate church, blah, 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 right? And I was like, okay, why? She's like, they're this, they're this, they're judgmental, they're like, blah, blah, blah. And there's so much pressure and she has a gay friend and her dad's like, if you, people find out you have a gay friend, you'll never get married and you need to get married and they don't want your reputation tarnished. And, and she's like talking about, and then she just kept saying God and dad interchangeably. 
And I'm like, you don't hate God. You hate your dad. Your dad is the judgmental one. Your dad is the one who's saying, you know, she's like, you know, God just cares about appearances and God just doesn't like this. And God just, I'm like, no, that's fine. Daddy's the one that's saying all those things, right? So she mixed the two up. And then I, I pointed out to her and she goes, yeah, you're exactly right. Right, I'm, I'm, you know, so you become the image of God to a child. And so everything you say, every way you act, they just absorb it, you know? I don't know if you understand Arabic. Guru Ndud Lamani has this great expression, it's only good in Arabic. He says, right? which means, you know, raising a child, it's just absorption. You don't really have to do a good job. There's no good job or bad job, right? You just be. Your kid's going to turn out just like you, right? Just like you turn out your, like your parents, even though you don't want to be like your parents, right? Good luck. We all turn out like our parents, right? It sucks. Okay? That's just the way it is, right? And, you, and your kid is going to turn out just like you. And if you're this angry person, they're going to turn out just like you, right? So if you want to raise good kids, just be good. Be good. And your kids, you can you can mess it up. You can do all the right things, send them to the right schools, blah, 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 blah. You know, do I put them in Taekwondo or karate? Who cares? <laughs> so worry less, right? Just be, be that light. And they'll, they'll figure it out. They'll feel it. I don't know. I don't know more stuff to say, but it's boring. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs>